Hello, everybody. My name's Edith Bowman, and I am delighted would be an understatement, actually, uh, to be here with you this evening and um, to celebrate the extraordinary talent of our panel this evening. It's the original score panel as part of this year's EE BAFTA Film Sessions. The annual series celebrates the nominees from the upcoming EE British Academy Film Awards. Uh, a couple of little housekeeping bits, if you don't mind, before we get started. And um, you can join in the conversation, please, on socials by using the hashtag EE BAFTAs. Um, if you've got a question, which I'm hoping many of you do, uh, then pop it into the Q&A function and we'll come to it at the end of the discussion. We've left a little bit of time at the end to get any burning questions from you guys. So please do not hesitate to get those in. And we also have BSL available for today session and also captions are available by hitting the CC button at the bottom of the screen. Now we have an incredible panel this evening. Um, we have Volker Bertelman uh, here to celebrate his work on All Quiet on the Western Front. Hi Volker, great to have you with us. Hi, hi it is. Uh, we have Justin Hurwitz here celebrating his work on Babylon. Justin, thank you for being here. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, we have Carter Burwell here to celebrate his work on the Banshees of Inisherin. Hi, it's great to be here. Great to have you as well. Thank you so much. And we have Son Lux, who are in fact Rafiq Bhatia, uh, Ryan Loft and Ian Chang, who are joining us to celebrate their work on uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. What an honour. Yeah. Fabulous. Now, unfortunately, Alexander Despla can't be with us today, but we are lucky enough to have been sent an extract from his work from Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, which we can have listened to a little bit later on. Um, Volker, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind. But before we chat, uh, should we just take a, a little moment to celebrate a piece of your work from All Quiet on the Western Front? <laughs> Wow. I'm I'm going to self-implode, I think, by the end of this session, to be honest. And we couldn't have uh, an extract from that without that amazing kind of motif that we hear, you know, kind of throughout throughout the film. Those three notes that really kind of resonate so much. Let's go back, though, Volker, please, and talk a little bit about, um, about Edward presenting the idea of working on this film, because you guys have worked together in the past, but but when the opportunity to to work and collaborate with him again was presented, what what was that conversation? What was the uh, what was the ask, and what did you connect to? Well, we um, I mean we met um, very late in the process because the film was already pretty much uh, done in a way, and um, the edit was very um, already very close to be finished. Um, and we had a screening in London and in Berlin in a, in a bigger cinema. And uh, um, you know after the. the the film everybody was pretty quiet i mean it's uh, it's mostly all the time when you when this film is finished nobody is really applauding or they they are just quiet and uh, i think you can feel that somehow the film is sinking in them and then at some point i imagine that they go home and they talk with each other about uh, what they've seen um, and uh, in a way that was the same with the with the two of us we just watched it and then um Edward said just, I think, five things to me, and then I went off. Uh, he just said to me, I want to have a score from you that you've never done before, which was a wow. big, like... No pressure. Uh, no pressure at all. <laughs> um, the, the other sentence was, uh, I want to have destruction. I mm -hmm. want to have you to destroy the images. That was what he said. Um, he said, um, 
I want to have music for Paul Boimer's stomach. And that was a little bit, I think, expressing his, you know, his dehumanization through the process of being a soldier in quite a quick amount of time because uh, he went into the war free willingly, thinking that it's an adventure. Yeah. And then, you know, he slowly feels like, oh, that was a mistake. And uh, but he can't go back. So that is a little bit the theme of uh, Paul Barmer's stomach. And then um, he said, I want to have a snare drum in the in the film that is played by somebody who can't play the snare drum. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, yeah, I, I was always, I always loved uh, uh, like drumming, but I can't play it. But I think in this film, it is really important that it's a drummer that can't play drums, which was the, the most uh, difficult part of the whole uh, <laughs> score, because uh, first of all, I had to find a sound that sounds like a, dis like whatever, a destroyed snare. But then mm -hmm. I also had to find somebody who's playing it in a way that it sounds like he can't play. Uh, and that's very difficult because normally we play with musicians that are extremely, uh, you know, gifted in their craft. Um, and uh, but I because I'm playing a lot prepared piano, I know exactly how to destroy a sound um, <laughs> by, by taping by taping things dead or, you know. So what um, with this with this impression, I went back home. And in the train from Berlin to Düsseldorf, I was actually thinking I need an instrument from that time because I wanted to find something that is a little bit historical, but that is mm. also that I can also use like a modular synthesizer in a way. And that is a machine and that is um, inside some mechanical instrument that has a lot of noise. That was one thought. And um the other thing was that I needed uh, like a, a very small motive because when I heard the, the film the first time, I mean, there was so much explosions and gunfire that um, it felt to me I just need something that I can, you know, pull and like that I that is not on grid that I can actually everywhere place wherever there's a space, I can place yeah. it. Because um, when you have a frequency that is always covering music, if you have a four or five or six uh, me tone melody, it will be always interrupted. And then you always miss one note and it never sounds like exactly the same melody. So I felt it needs a very precise and short motive that I can maybe extend at some point into a violin melody or I can actually extend it into a more, you know, a, a theme that is maybe more... Um, um, a religious theme because i had the feeling it needs in some areas a theme where people are asking or where the where the soldiers are asking themselves or where they're dreaming of their lost homes and uh, yeah. their, their families uh, there's specifically one scene when the women appear um there's one it's a little bit like a fata morgana because they just appear as a as a wish of you know why can't we go home and and live a life that we had before so next day not even 24 hours after that day i just went home and i sat down at the harmonium of my grand grandmother and i just played those three notes uh, and i put them through a, a big distortion and uh, mm. boosted the bass and uh, put some reverbs on it and i just wrote this whole first piece and I sent that to Edward because normally I, I mean, all the other composers here that are fantastic um, are, I guess, all knowing that you don't send one piece to a director normally <laughs> because <laughs> it's just the 50, 50 ch percent chance. And you, you just want to get first, maybe give a wider range of what you want to feel in the film. But in this case, I just felt so overwhelmed by that theme that I said, I have to send it to him. And if he says no, I'm depressed and I will maybe <laughs> I have to do something completely different. So I send it to him on the next day. And uh, the next day I got a call and they were cheering in their in their uh, living room, uh, him and uh, Edward and his wife. And they were like, just like, this is awesome. We really think this is exactly the theme. And then, you know, the leashes were cut and I could work with it. And that was very yeah. nice. Um, but it, it could have been any three notes and you know in terms of what what was it about the what you came up with what did you where did that come from what was the what do you think inspired that that's what you came up with and that you went and created it on that specific 
instrument, do you think? Well, my way of uh, working is mostly I'm putting color on the canvas and then I'm mm -hmm. trying to scrap the color off. It's a little bit like what I learned from from painters here in Dusseldorf. Uh, we have a lot of uh, art artists here and uh, a lot of times I'm visiting them in their in their gallery spaces and I really like how they are painting because what they do, they put like, let's say, eight um, colors on top of each other and then they take some, mm -hmm. you know, and, and scrape things off and suddenly the, the first color appears somewhere again. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I just made... I made longer stretches of recordings just intuitively um, and then I, I just cut it out the areas that I really loved and I think I was already using these three notes in one in one area but I cut it a little shorter and then I wanted to see if it fits somewhere in the gaps um, so you know it was in a way cut it out of an improvised part. And would you say it was a combination of the, you know, you said that the the film was kind of, it was short, it was a, it was at a stage of editing. Would you say that the performances and Felix in particular, who takes on that 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 you know that lead character of Paul, inspired you as well? Was it a combination of that and the scripts? You think or? Well, I mean, every every film that is played and um, you know performed extremely well is a gift for a composer because you don't mm -hmm. have to fill fill any holes in the you know in areas where the where, let's say where the performance is lacking or where you have the feeling that or where some in the process somebody says we need some more emotions in that scene and I mm -hmm. think that's for me for me for example very um well it's it's sometimes necessary but I think when a, a film is already working without music it's always nice to find really the spots where you can enhance the effect of that that music is giving something to the film rather than you are forcing it and you are forcing the people to feel something in the in you know in the acting and uh, i had the feeling in this film it was very nice because edward is always also somebody who always says don't rather stay minimal you know when i when i started the let's say the three tone element and I sent it to him for me it was pretty clear that he doesn't want to have me you know going very deep into the soldier's emotions um, in some parts but th that it's much more like a, a another actor in the in the film yeah. that actually helps to go in areas that is not in a way played uh, so that you have let's say there's one scene for example when there's a light bulb flying over the over the battlefield and I, I just used a very like fragile violin that plays in a way the theme but very long in in terms it's stretched and it sounds a little bit like you are at new year's eve and everything is very beautiful and it starts to you know the audience is feeling like ah what a relief it's it's getting very nice and then suddenly you see the shadows mm -hmm. appearing from the battlefield and suddenly you you are fooled by the by the music in a way and that's what i felt was very interesting for me that you are a part of of changing the perspective in a way um, and, yeah uh, yeah so that was mainly what we did amazing um justin let's talk about babylon before we do actually uh let's hear and see something from babylon please I want to get up and dance to that is quite a <laughs> it's quite hard not to um congratulations on on the work on this film Justin I mean, and kind of opposite to what Volker was talking about there is so much 
preparation before filming required of you, you know, kind of going into this. Talk to me a little bit about where you started and, you know, at what point Damien was at with regards to how how meticulous he was with with kind of his vision. But at that point, I guess. Yeah. So I started uh, as soon as there was a script, as soon as there was a draft of the script that Damien felt like sharing, I read it. And um, we just started going through it and marking up where we thought music would be, um, at least a certain kind of music, the music that we had to figure out beforehand. So um, a lot of the the places were clear enough in the script because it said, you know, Sydney was playing trumpet or a band was at a party. But um, it wasn't always clear to me where that music started and where that music ended because Damien wanted to play a lot with, um, to use kind of like a, uh, like a film theory term, diet diegetic, diegesis. Yeah. He wanted to play with when it was diegetic and when it wasn't diegetic, meaning like when it would turn into score, when it would maybe start as a performance, but then spill over into a different area, carry us over to a different scene, carry us to a different location. So I had to understand that architecture. Um, so we we went through and we started marking up. Here's where things start. Here here's where things end. Both for performances and montages and other kinds of cues. Um, there were lots of cues that we just saved for post. You know, like any film scoring job, you have to watch the scenes and watch the movie um, for a certain kind of cue. But for a lot of it, we were able to at least talk about and um, plot out where where it would be. So. For those cues, uh, I just started writing demos. Um, we always start here at the piano, looking for the the tunes and the themes. And then once we have those, uh, you know, go over here to arrangement ideas and start playing with instrumentation. So we did that for a while. Um, it was only supposed to be about um, maybe eight months of that, but it ended up being a year and eight months, I suppose, because the pandemic pushed everything by a year. So we were supposed to shoot summer of 20 and then ended up pushing an entire year. So shooting summer of 21. So during that time, we were just playing around with ideas, building demos, con- continuing to throw things out, start from scratch, throw things out, start from scratch. Mm-hmm. Um, and also he's a very careful planner when it comes to animatics. So he was doing a lot of animatics at this time, a lot of stick figures. He just draws literally thousands of pages of stick figures. A few scenes he he worked with a storyboard artist, but a lot of it is just, he's just scribbling, you know, frames and shots and camera movements. And so he's, during this period, I was making demos and then he was cutting the demos to animatics that he was making out of the storyboards. So we were just refining structure and timings and things. I was, of course, shaping the music to fit the timings that he needed. But then every now and then he would sort of adjust his timings to fit the music if he thought something needed to sort of, if he wanted to keep a melody intact or keep a timing intact. So we were just building animatic and demo at the the same time up until um, uh, we did a week of pre-records at Capitol. And brought a lot of musicians in, recorded a lot of the music, spent about a month mixing it. And then we had the shoot. So then we're on set. Then we do that whole thing and uh, shoot the movie. And then there's about another year of post um, where we get offices next to each other. And that's when they're really, that's when I'm really writing cues to the, to what I'm seeing. So we're going yeah. back and we're adjusting a lot of what we did. Um, you know, Damien, like I said, he not just storyboards, but he has such an incredible mind where every every shot, every timing is in his head before he shoots a movie. So we get close. We always get close when we have to do that pre, pre-production thing, but it's never, it's never perfect because things change. Things don't come out exactly. Things take longer or shorter on set. Of course, things change in the edit. So during that next year, I'm reshaping, rebuilding, refining the, the pre-records, but then also writing a lot of new cues too for the, for the rest of the movie. How much music do you say you wrote for the film, roughly? I mean, wrote in terms of what's actually in the movie, I think it's a little over two hours. Wow. In terms of like the the kind of the the thematics of it as well, because obviously the, the, it's set in the 20s, but there was a really clear idea, wasn't there, about, about it not feeling like something that it's kind of that kind of thing. Is it from that era? Is it not, you know, in terms of it's got to feel new in a way and it kind of straddling a kind of a contemporary 
lightness to it as well as it having a foot in the 20s was that an easy thing to come at in terms of that kind of that sound and that energy and that drive of of a lot of the music yeah I was very very happy when when he said he wanted to avoid 20s jazz because as soon as I read it I thought really entertaining scripts but oh I don't want to have to do 1920s jazz it's something we've heard a lot of times and it's It's just not something I was excited to write. But as soon as Damien and I started talking, he said, I really want to avoid 20s jazz. I want to be a lot more aggressive, a lot more rock and roll, a lot more, definitely a foot in the 20s. You know, we don't want to take anybody out of it. We don't want it to be so anachronistic that people don't believe they're there. But we wanted it to be, um, the the jazz to be a lot more aggressive and unhinged um, a lot of the time. so yeah, we, we, we started talking. One of the ideas, Damien, he had done a lot of research. So I was just sort of getting the cliff notes of his research. But one of the ideas he told me, which I thought was kind of inspiring was the music that we think of as 20s jazz, we think of it, we think of it because it was recorded in the 20s. It's, it's, it's the music that we've actually heard. But what we've heard because it was recorded was actually just a small sliver of what was actually played at the time. That yeah. there are very few people... It was such a new technology recording. Very few people had the opportunity to go in and record. So there was actually a more interesting and vibrant music scene at parties, at underground clubs. And Damien had read a bunch of oral histories and accounts of these, you know, I mean, the 20s, he, the part of the 20s that he's trying to show us in a lot of these scenes is a really wild part of the 20s, a real orgies and drug filled parties and all this stuff that you know is a lot not as as quaint as we think of the 20s so he he had, <laughs> he had come across a lot of accounts of these sweaty bands that are just like you know kind of really going for it in a way that doesn't doesn't sound like the the sort of quaint charleston swingy sort of jazz that we think of as 20s so we got to sort of imagine well what could that have been? What could that have been mm. in some of those music scenes? We definitely went further with stuff. Um, there are elements of this score when it comes to like dance hi-hats and all sorts of like more modern dance music elements that I'm sure we've cheated more modern than was actually going on at these, even these underground parties. But we could, we could, we could definitely take more license than, uh, you know, strictly what we think of as 20s jazz. Um because like I said, you know, 20s jazz was was a lot more, 20s music was just a lot more interesting than what was going on in, uh, you know, the jazz we've heard. Yeah. You also then have to kind of strip it back though as well, you know, with this 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 the story of Manny and, and Nelly and, and those moments and kind of telling their story and their relationship through score as well. And those, and, and that sort of theme that's created that, that kind of is reintroduced at different times throughout the film, um, and, and that's a really, do you mind talking a little bit about that, about coming up with that? And then also the idea of of kind of, you know, manipulating it throughout the film for different reasons and for different moments. Yeah. So the theme that's the Manny Nelly theme is um, sometimes it's played very up-tempo on a baritone sax. This incredible sax player, Leo Pellegrino, um, who plays like dance music on a sax. Pe- people might have seen viral videos of him literally dancing like in the New York subway. He kicks his legs, he spins while he plays. He's like a real showman. So he plays that tune in the up-tempo um, versions of it. But for the the more uh, emotional versions of it that we use for the Manny Nelly scenes, it's, um, it's slowed down. It's harmonized, first of all, whereas the dance versions never harmonized. It's just a it's just a sax lead and percussion, basically. So it's harmonized in kind of a bittersweet way. And then we went around a lot of ideas before we found the right instrumentation for it. What it ended up being is three pianos blended together. Um, one of them is just a very beautiful, mellow Steinway, just a pretty, you know, mid-sized grand. I always go to um I like to find very specific pianos. So I always go to this place uh, called uh, Hollywood Piano. It's a, it's just a big warehouse full of pianos. Um, well, I found a few other places, but there's this great warehouse here. So I go and I find pianos. I found this just like perfectly mellow one, but kind of mid size, So it's got a lot of character. And that is um, the, the, the grand, the mid size grand is blended with a attack piano, which, uh, I think Volker would know what I'm talking about as a prepared piano guy, but it's like a piano where with tacks in the hammers to kind of give it a twang. 
Um, but also detuned, so it's a bit out of tune. That piano is like a, 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 l- a little bit out of tune, a little sour. And then the third piano is a very, very, very out of tune, broken upright. So these three pianos, the like beautiful Steinway, the sort of out of tune tack piano, and then the super out of tune upright, it, um, they you get the sweetness from one, you get the different amounts of sourness from the other, you get this sort of chorusine broken effect um this sort of fragile effect from all three blended together that just kind of felt like their relationship so we had gone around and tried a lot of different ideas but once we kind of came up with this blend it felt fragile and vulnerable and kind of broken like that relationship that we were trying to score amazing thank you so much justin i'm gonna move on to carter hey carter um before we we chat um let's hear some of your wonderful work from the Banshees of the Sharon. so lovely just for everybody hearing the music you know kind of just on it on its own you kind of are, are reminded just of how powerful and emotive it is it's just it's lovely and um, card thank you for being here it's my pleasure instrument instrumentation in 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 this this beautiful score is 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 extraordinary what was the journey to 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 knowing what you know what, what was the right for this film and for these characters and for this location as well the setting of this film? Well, it actually all began with finding out what was wrong. Um, I had a discussion with Martin McDonough before he shot, and we were really mostly talking about um, the fiddle parts that Brendan Gleeson has to play on camera. It's just as Justin was saying, we had to prepare that before the shoot. And <clears throat> um, Martin wanted to know if I was going to write that, and if I wrote it, would it somehow be related to the score? And as it so happens, Brendan is a fiddler and he wanted to write it. He plays a composer in in the film. So we both thought that, well, if it just so happens that Brendan's piece is okay, it would be great if if he wrote it. He would tie him to the the character he's portraying. um, And in the end, he did. We both liked what Brendan came up with. But that caused us to have a conversation before the film was shot. And um, we did talk a little bit about the score. And I've said, you know, well, it's about two Irishmen off the coast of Ireland during the Irish Civil War. The score might be a bit Irish, wouldn't you think? And and, <laughs> and Martin hated that idea. Um, and he he didn't he couldn't exactly say why he hated it, but it was clearly a touch of nerve. He said, "Oh, I hate that deedle d old world Irish <laughs> film music." And anyway, I, I couldn't bring that up ever again. Clearly, um, so. Uh, I really wasn't sure, though, what what else it would be. Um, but honestly, for me, seeing the film tells me so much. You know, I, I really do respond very much to the the colors, the placement of the camera, the the eyes of the actors. I mean, you name it. I, I really do um, feed off of the visuals. So I didn't really have to do anything until I, I saw some of what they'd shot. And... I just started at the beginning, honestly, when you see Colin Farrell's character and this, he's walking around smiling. It's You get the impression that he's had a very nice life right up until like two minutes into the film. <laughs> um, so I, I began there and um, and also began with instruments that are a bit childlike. Uh, you know, there's, you hear there the celeste, which is basically like a glockenspiel with a keyboard on it and harp. Uh, mm. Some marimba. I mean, uh, instruments you would find in an elementary school, perhaps. Um, and 
then I just sort of broadened it from from that. But it begins um, like what you heard in that piece. It's so simple. It's like a child could play it. But then as the harmonies build, it becomes it suggests that it's not quite as um, as simple as as it sounds. And that was basically the direction that I took was to begin with the, the simplest possible melodies, uh, three notes, and um, but then harmonize them and add instruments, especially down lower than the ones I've just mm -hmm. talked about, like gamelan, gongs, and uh, pizzicato bass, things that darken it and make the harmonies more complex. The harmonics of those instruments are odd and they don't add up in the way that, you know, you might expect. So um, it's, you know, the score right till the end plays those same sort of childlike tunes, but um, but there is also, I think, something, you know, moving underneath that suggests that, uh, you know, it's not as simple as it, it appears. It almost sounds almost a bit like the kind of um, the the banshee she's kind of you know it's it's a little bit of her kind of spirit almost in a way you know that the crazy old lady who who appears <laughs> every now and again <laughs> oh she's here again um of that kind of the, the sort of the darkness there is that there's this kind of brilliant almost like you say sort of nursery rhyme element but with this kind of twist of darkness to it which is it's so hypnotic in a way as as well um and I and feel just like that, there was well, I was just gonna say, I do feel like there's something about that island that is, you know, it's just suggested that there's some dark mystery to it. And she's definitely the, you know, certainly that character you're describing is like that. But also even when they just cut to shots of goats and birds, there's um, a lot of nature uh, the, in the in the film that isn't in the script. And yeah, suggest, yeah, that there is some um, basic thing that's been there for hundreds of years that is somehow dark and um, and at work. And then when you're thinking outside of those two main characters, you know, Colin and Brendan, and you know, in particular, particularly um, Kerry and, and Barry's characters, and and how how their story and their cues kind of what was the conversation around that? Because those are such particularly that scene at the lake with with Barry and, and Kerry is 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 incredibly powerful when you're thinking about that side of things and, and bringing in what's already existing or, or does it need something new? What's the kind of the journey with that? Well, you know, it's, it's all, um, well, for instance, the piece that we just heard is actually from the scene where Siobhan um, Carey's character is leaving the Island. So that's the most emotional scene in the film probably. Mm. And uh, Colin Farrell's character is losing the one person that he, you know, really, depends upon and has his whole life. And um, and yet the score is really still pretty stripped down. I mean, you don't hear the strings swell. There are some strings in the background there, but you know, they're really hidden. And um, so the approach with emotion is really in the score is to really, really underplay it. Because one of the things about the movie is that whatever you're expecting the movie to be, it isn't. Uh, you know, whatever you're going mm -hmm. expecting. You know, there's no way to describe this film to someone, I don't think. Um, there's almost no plot. It's really not about things that are happening. It's about the characters and their um, the ways that they express themselves and the they're going through completely, well, mostly normal things. Uh, admittedly, it, Martin takes it a little far, but mostly <laughs> a normal, um, normal part of life to people who like they've been getting along, but now they're not getting along anymore and um and just explores that um anyway the the music really tries never to like manipulate the audience yeah. it's sort of what Volker was talking about it's like really stands back from that and um in the end I realized that one of the things that I was doing I didn't I didn't start from this concept but that I by this group of instruments and my general approach is that I was sort of turning it into a fable. It was, you know, a little bit more of a fairy tale kind of sound. And uh, so that when you get to these sort of horrible things happening later on in the film, you know, I don't think you take them as, as being physical reality. It's not like you imagine that this is really happening to these people. It becomes more of a fable about, um, about human humans and, you know, uh, how things, um, you know, are never really good, never going to really work out for us as a species, but we're going to do our <laughs> best. Um, uh, but um, this, you know, it like I say, that wasn't the way I began, but I did realize at a certain point, actually, I can tell you the point I was 
actually reading to my daughter one day. I was about halfway through the score and um, reading Grimm's fairy tales and we're reading Cinderella mm -hmm. and the bit where the um, stepmother has her daughters cut off parts of their feet to fit into the, the slipper, mm -hmm. not in the Disney version of Cinderella, but um, it's in the story. And I thought, this reminds me of something, <laughs> of something <laughs> I've, I'm working on, uh, you know, and, and I realized that what I, what, I was doing uh, was in a way turning it into a fable. And um, and then I just went full bore into that and Martin uh, liked it too. It made it just, it made a lot of sense that it's the one thing in the film that takes you away from Ireland. And I think that's what he, his original note was uh, that you know, everything else, the, the photography, the outfits, the sets, everything is um, very much puts you in this place and this time, but um, the music takes you out of it a bit and more, um, you should say generalizes the the story and helps you with the you know the physical um horror that is also part of some of the story was there an element of kind of trepidation when you were both waiting for the arrival of brendan's fiddle song <laughs> a little bit um not really trepidation um but um i was aware that i you know yes i think for all of us it would have it's been honestly more for martin it would have been hard to say uh Thank you, but no, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, um, that would have been tough because, uh, yeah. you know, obviously as a writer and director, you want the character, the actor, to fully commit to the character, and um, and one way of looking at this movie and the story is it is about um, creativity and the trade off you make if you're going to be a creative person and you have to shut the door on other parts of your life. Uh, that's one interpretation, and Brendan is that character in this film. And if, yeah, we'd had to say, mm, no, um, yeah, that would have been tough. But um, but anyway, that did not happen. And I didn't have to, I never did write uh, a piece for it. Um, thank God, because uh, I wouldn't want to be up, <laughs> up against a 250 pound angry Irish fiddler. Um, so um, yeah, it, was, it worked you out. You might have lost a finger to Carter. <laughs> yes, that's <right. laughs> Um, just to remind our audience as well that we do have a little bit of time at the end for our audience questions and we'd love and I'm sure that you have many so don't do that thing where we, we run out of time when you haven't had your questions so please put them in via the, the Q&A function please um, uh, before we finish. Um, next up so excited to talk about uh, everything everywhere all at once uh, with Rafik Warren and Ian but first let's take a listen. So lovely watching your faces whilst that was playing as well the, the pride in your faces that's so great is it is it a different experience for you because me people might you know Sonlux is a band but you also this is is this your second feature film that you've composed or is have I got that wrong sorry this is number one for us as a band is it yeah wow how did the project how did the Daniels present it to you then what was the how did how did this yeah how did you end up composing the film well we got a couple of um early directors from them the first was in the form of a really um just wonderful like zoom hangout kind of like this one where they explained the concept of this um this crazy movie to us and they they told us about how um you know that they really had a, a kind of direct reason for coming to us. They'd listened to our records together as a band. They'd listen, all three of us make our own music outside of the band. They'd listen to that too. And, you know, they they felt that because of the sheer volume of universes in this film and the rate at which we switch between them, that it would be really important for music and musical sound texture specifically 
to help us differentiate as an audience, um, you know, which universe we're in at a given time. And it needs to be like almost on a precognitive level that you feel that you're in that universe so that when it really gets to its most um, maximal channel switching, you know, um, sort of moments that um, the audience is able to, to track those things. And because they need to be distinct, there is an mm. element of almost like randomness or unrelatedness that the universe is needed to have. But then they were hoping that, you know, over the course of the story, as everything starts to converge, that as composers, we would find ways to reconcile all these seemingly disparate universes into something that could cohere into a sound that could deliver the emotional punch of the film and you know so for us that was a huge honor because we felt very seen like all three of us in our own ways like we all grew up listening to different music and and being inspired by different things but i think we all love this thing where um hybridity can exist and be embodied in music where you know um you can express yourself in the way that contrary parts of yourself are reconciled in your humanity, you know? And so those are things that we all love in music. And so we were really excited about that part. And then on the other hand, they handed us this script, which was for a, I think a four hour version of the movie that wow. had a whole side plot about a character named Spaghetti Baby Noodle Boy and like all of these <laughs> other things. <laughs> that didn't actually make it into the film and you know so we had had this really inspiring conversation and then we go to the script and Ryan is like hey is my pdf out of order or something like <laughs> I, I think this might be broken like something's you know so we were on one hand we, were, we felt like this like really great trust from them and on the other hand we were just like is this possible are they actually going to make this happen <laughs> there's no way they were going to make that movie <laughs> I, I was still they did <laughs> <laughs> what did you react to you know in terms of so the, the the conversation and then the script was the thing that you had what was the you know what were the conversations that you had with each other with regards to what you thought you know in terms of instrumentation as well and also you know for the from the perspective as well and because the, the, the music goes on a journey in this film in the same way you know Evelyn is really it, 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 you know it's almost kind of like her brain in a way um, what were the conversations that you had with regards to what you wanted it to be? Ian, you're going to have to pick up on this one? Sure, yeah. I think one <laughs> of the things that we realized pretty early on that we wanted to achieve and wanted to do is to have some very strong melodic themes. Um, that's one way sort of that we were able to sort of reconcile a lot of these different sound worlds um, and also explore, you know, presenting melodies cloaked in different kinds of harmonies and things like that for different parts of the movie. Um, I wouldn't say that the themes were necessarily very strictly stuck to like certain characters or anything like that. Um, yeah. But I think it helped sort of, it helps guide the, the viewer along you know, the movie is so maximal and it's so kind of, there's so many different things happening all the time. And really the first time anyone watches it, I feel like it's just like a barrage. And I think the themes kind of help it feel somewhat digestible. Um, so we kind of were tasked like Rafiq was saying with this kind of channel switching, you know, um, way of composing where there's like a lot of different it almost feels like you're making music for three different films, you know, or more, uh, but at the same time, trying to kind of like um, make it all make sense together. And one of the ways in which we did that, making it make sense together was through melody. Um, and the the bit of music that you just heard is a very kind of straight up um, yeah. uh, representation of one of those melodies uh, that gets used throughout the film the whole, the whole time. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that was, Melody that was one was, thing we wanted to wanted to achieve. Yeah, Ian um, and and Rafiq, like mm -hmm. I I remember in those original that original conversation that that um, that was a directive that they gave us that felt counterintuitive, 
Um, at least in my memory, I feel like that was a, that was like, we want this to be a melodic score. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that unites us as composers is that um, we, none of us, I think, uh, have a sort of sense of primacy about uh, melody, uh, maybe even harmony. We, we, I think we're all kind of like, we sort of like think rhythmically maybe before more than anything else or tech like texture sound color we're not like yeah. we're not like melody guys right so like we're not like theme we like the ideas of themes and things like this that are so like um like the baseline for for scoring uh for a lot of folks it's like it felt counterintuitive to us to be honest um especially reading the script you know like themes don't like leap out to you but gestures and splatter paints of like prismatic color and things all the things that felt intuitive for us as composers leapt out and so i think the directive was uh, that came from daniels was so wise because yes all of that is assumed you listen to your music you know um yes it's going to be hard on your sleeve listen to your music yes it's going to be dark and crazy and full of like contrast listen to your music but one of the things i want you guys to focus on is like you know finding these ways in which it's still like very melodic. And um, I think that was one of the first uh, great pieces of advice that Daniels had for us. Um, and I, and I, I, I think this score was never going to be possible unless we had their help. They just had so many amazing ideas along the way that, um, that were, that, you know, we benefited from. Did you go on set? Did you spend time whilst they were filming on set at all? We did one day on set, which was their final day before everything shut down due to COVID. Uh, they were pretty lucky. Um, you know, I remember Justin mentioning that like Babylon had to like hold off shooting the entire year for, for them. They shot, I think they were just like a couple days short of finishing their shooting, but we were able to be on set for one day uh, before everything kind of shut down and changed. Um, and that was, a really fun day for us because we've never done anything <laughs> like that before and the energy of those those guys that they kind of exude to everyone um on set both like cast and crew is is very infectious so it was, it was very um it was a fun experience yeah <laughs> and did it inform then you know in terms of, of of kind of being on and feeling that energy on set did that then inform or kind of inspire you know, because when you listen to that cue that we just played as well, the kind of the layers to that and the, the build on it and the, the journey of it is extraordinary. And so kind of, you know, just to, you, when you mentioned energy on set, I just wondered whether that fed into then what you went away to write. I think it's, it's funny. I think at lunch during that day, we managed to sit down with the Daniels for a second and we were talking about, I think that very melody and we had sent them a draft of it and they were talking about how like it's almost right and that there's like maybe few notes that needed to be changed. Uh, I think maybe they said that it needed to be more recognizable quicker, um, which kind of touches on something Volker was saying. It's like you want motifs to, even though the melody is long, you still want like maybe the beginning of it to be something that you can like mm -hmm. pick up, especially in a film where, you know, you get jerked around so much. Um, and yeah, I, I think it was a very inspiring time. And I think on set it was, um, I don't know if there was like necessarily anything that I can speak to directly that uh, I have a memory from yeah 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 do you remember when they were showing us both because we this was like you know like Ian said it was really close to the end for them so yeah. do you remember it was either Michelle or Key's phone where they were showing us all these photos we we're all huddled around a phone and they were like flipping through their photo library of all of the crazy things from the previous weeks of shooting and that's when we first saw glimpses of like the temple universe and like, um, you know, we saw some of the, um, right, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Like we, we actually got to see an early clip of the fanny pack fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like when I started to see those images, I was like, <laughs> oh, they really did this. <laughs> like, like it was the first time I feel like for me, I felt like I actually got like nervous oh because <laughs> i was like it was daunting yeah yeah because i was like i just i'm they're flipping through like millions of like 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 the cumulative effort expressed in that photo that like little impromptu <laughs> yeah. little slideshow like, slideshow yeah it was <laughs> like 
I, 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 it, I felt like I got like a little taste of what we were up against, you know? And I like, I, re I remember just being like, oh shit. <laughs> you know? but, we but also, also like got... sight, yeah. you know? Yeah, we also and here got... you are, like. <laughs> there was also just such a, we were armed with stuff too from that. Like I remember watching Michelle Yo shoot B-roll from the universe where she like lands on the red carpet and everyone's shooting photos of her and she's like you know it's like two seconds in the film she looks around and she's kind of confused about where she is and then she looks up the staircase and there's like her like who is in another universe like a very dorky husband with the fanny pack with the little like piglet keychain <laughs> on it you know like there he is in like a custom tailored suit, smiling down at her, looking absolutely like mesmerizing. And But we watched her act, you know, just shoot B-roll of those few seconds. It was the first thing we saw when we walked in. And I just remember being completely floored by that. Like her presence in each take, you know, it was like watching, you know, I, I come from like a, improvised music and and jazz like experimental kind of background and watching somebody who's so present in the moment and who's able to communicate in a completely different way in every single take all of the nuanced emotions the confusion the sort of like you know adjusting to a new reality like even as like cameras are flashing in the face like seeing this person and recognizing mm -hmm. them from another like all these very very specific um sort of things that she needed to embody that like she was able to do in such a subtle and understated way every single time like I was just watching that I was like okay we need to not mess this up with the music <laughs> but also we're not gonna need we don't have to help anyone because like the yeah. you know just the writing the acting the directing everybody mm -hmm. did such a great job that's and so the final thing I'll say about that is like, there's so much representation on screen of the AAPI community. And that's something that I feel really proud of being able to be a part of this movie. But the thing that we saw on set was like, there were so many AAPI folks off, cam like off camera doing all of, you know, like basically like every, every department on set felt diverse and it was really beautiful to like see a film where that was like a part of the value system like not just in terms of like like it's it's remarkable that it's what you see on camera but i think it's also really remarkable that it's part of what you see off camera you know um our, our, our final uh, nominee, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, uh, is Alexandre Desplat. Uh, but let's take a listen to an extract he sent us from Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Pinocchio. My boy. My boy. Wake up, Pinocchio. Like last time. Get up. You're fine, you, you. You are here. My dear son. Don't you see me? You're, you're alive. You're, you're so free. I... I need you. Oh. oh, it's really emotional that. Um, well, we've got some time for audience questions. Um, and this one is to everyone. Uh, how much it uh, doesn't say who it's from, though, uh, but it says, how much does your relationship with the director inform the score? Is it important for you to be brought in early in the process? Who wants to start on that one? I mean, some of you have kind of talked about that a little bit, but I guess it depends on, well, Justin, well, you can start. I'll, okay, Carl, go for Carl, yeah. 
I mean, I know Justin and I both worked several times with, you know, the director that we're, we're, we're yeah. talking about right now. And I'll say the biggest thing it means to me is that there is trust there. And so that I can be more experimental. Uh, I can send him stuff that, you know, maybe I know he's not expecting and I know he's not going to fire me and, and replace me with Hans Zimmer because we've, you know, the, the trust is there for me to do stuff. And, um, and the same and vice versa, you know, I, I, he can also be honest with me, brutally honest with me. And he knows I'm not going to, you know, you know, fire him. Uh, it's, uh, so I don't know, that's one, there are many other things you could say about it, but that's, that's one. And I think it's very important. It allows you to, to do the unexpected and it's hard, it's hard to do that if you don't have a relationship to begin with. I, I personally, I totally agree with that because the, the thing is that sometimes it's underestimated how fragile a composer in its, you know, in himself is, I mean, and I think other artists are the same. Um, and sometimes it's interesting that you are chosen, but at the same time, you're not chosen for the right reason. You are chosen because you're needed very quickly or you, um, you know, and I think to have a conversation with somebody in the first place and just find out what the, what the reason is, why you are chosen, then um, you find out that uh, there is, I, I think there are a few questions you can ask and by the answer of those questions, you can straight away say you're chosen because you're they want to have your craft rather than you know the the service i would say and mm -hmm. the other way around whenever you get um let's say somebody's starting to mistrust you you go back to the service uh function <laughs> and you reduce the arts in a way and the risk um, and I think that's very important in the communication with a director to find out if you really want yourself and uh, or if you want to have something else and then I'm sometimes you also decide I guess um, you want to you know you want to do something differently that you can't do in your art which I'm mostly doing I, I love actually being challenged um, and I'm forced maybe to work on something else as my own music um, and I think that's uh, that goes back into my records again. And I, you know, so in a way, both things are informing each other very well. Yeah, and Just on the issue of trust, I I rely so heavily on Damien to help guide me. I think everybody needs an editor because we all, I think, all of us, we have ideas that range from very bad to very good, and <laughs> I I get. I really embrace the no, 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 maybe no, 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 no. Oh, that one's better than all of the others. And I really rely on, um, I just think we have way more bad or okay ideas than we have actually really, really good ones. So um, I've come to trust Damien's instincts and his taste so much in helping me weed through all of my ideas and find the, find the really good ones. And he's very, very hard to please. But when you finally do please him, you can know that you really did your best work. So I, I've i just come to really, um, yeah, just really embrace the process with him and know that it can be very, very hard, especially this phase when I'm at the piano, just melody. We he's He's obsessed with melody. I'm obsessed with melody and theme. And that can be the most discouraging part, just searching, 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 because you never know when the right thing is going to happen. But when you finally do get that yes from him, it feels so good. It feels so mm -hmm. good. And it kind of makes the, the, um, all the pain worth it. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in terms of for you guys, you know, this, this being the, your first film and coming from a band and you are, you do have to kind of relinquish, you know, you're facilitating the film, you're facilitating something other than yourselves with this, with, you know, you're, you're being brought in for your, your, your art and your craft. But how how was that experience for that first time, you know, of, of kind of, I guess, you know, kind of having a boss kind of thing of someone who kind of telling you what he needs and what he wants from you? Did you enjoy that? Did you? Well, uh, um, I, I've, I, I have personally I have a lot of uh, scoring experience, um, mm. but this was our, our first score as a band. But yeah, um, I'm not going to answer that question directly. I'd rather answer just the I just want to comment on the trust thing. Um, yeah specifically, which is that in, in my case, um, the, what 
the trust that we had from the Daniels did is it enabled me, I'll just speak for myself, enabled me to discover places inside of me that um, I never would have discovered otherwise. There was a kind of a trust that they had that was so deep that it was inherently a challenge to be more than I had expected of myself in the past. And it's for that reason that I feel so thankful to this project because I feel like I didn't contribute to it. I feel like it contributed to me. I truly feel that. It's like, it feels like I was given some extraordinary yes. gift. Um, and I, 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 I just could not have anticipated it. And to kind of like circle that back to the question a little bit, like I feel like there were things about this that were really fun and refreshing and exhilarating for me personally, you know, being in a band and writing, you know, music for music's sake or whatever you want to call it, they, you know, you're often staring at a blank page or just like bouncing musical ideas off of one another. So to be able to respond to the story and picture and things like that was very stimulating for me. And I think that's one of the reasons why Ryan and all of us were challenged to, you know, reach inside ourselves to be like, can I write a musical that's like about a universe with everyone has hot dog hands? You know, it's like, no one's ever gonna ask me to do that ever before or ever again so it's like you're we were really forced to discover different things inside of ourselves and I think one of the things actually that we reacted to after reading the script and kind of like checking out Daniels's body of work I was like okay like well you know we are a pretty self-serious band in terms of the music that we make um how are we going to kind of like lean into some of the more like humorous aspects of this movie um and, you know, there, there are moments where we were needed to do that. And Ryan actually mostly killed it with like the song about Rakakuni or the, the, the Hot Dog Hands musical song. But for the most part, Dick Daniels kind of helped us, and I'm straying away from the question, but they helped us understand that like to sell the moments of absurdity, we really had to actually play it completely straight faced and really serious. Um, and it's funny because I was, you know, in charge of scoring the scene where people are fighting with butt plugs in their butts. And like, after a while, I like, didn't even notice that, like, I wasn't even thinking how, like, how ridiculous is this? I was just like, so invested in like the, the strike that was actually happening. In the <laughs> just making <laughs> badass music. <laughs> exactly. Um, yes. We got one, are we gonna, do you wanna pick up on that Rafi before? I've just got no, one no, last no, question. No, okay, you sure? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. We'll finish on the butt plugs here, it's good, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got one quick question if you don't mind asking that someone sent in uh the anonymous again which is always very annoying just put your name in um it says is there a score from a movie uh that really stuck with you or reminded you of the power of a score that uh, can have in elevating a scene or film i guess they're asking for your favorite score from a film if you wouldn't all mind answering that if you can but who wants to go first? <laughs> Nobody. Right. Okay. Who? Anyone got an answer to that? I can. I can start. Yes, I, Volker. I, I, thank I you. I was. I think. Um, <laughs> even though there were many, you know, I, I was born in a very small village in Germany, and we had a the most uh, like a, the the best. It was voted for the best cinema in Germany all the time, every year. So when I was a oh, kid, wow. I was going to that cinema all the time. So I think I was inspired already at that time from a lot of film music, specifically, I would say from Westerns with Ennio Morricone. I think that was where the first moments where I was completely emotionalized and coming back home. But uh, I would say for my work, I, I think the most um, impressive score before I started actually my own work as a uh, film composer was uh, There Will Be Blood from uh, Johnny Greenwood. That was Don't a wait. film that, because the the whole, I, I think the music was extremely, not disturbing, but there was something very weird in the music that where mm. I had the feeling it's actually not only music that was, you know, that I heard before, it was more like, in a way, um, you know, describing uh, something that was a, a, a in between the lines in a way yeah and I, I really love that so um yeah that was my one 
Good choice. Who wants to go next? Justin? You got one? Uh, sure. I'll go with uh, I'll go with something really old. I'll go with City Lights. Um the first of all, Chaplin's tunes are just absolutely unforgettable. I think people mm -hmm. don't talk enough about like what a great composer he was. I think we're just like, oh, he did that too. But no, his tunes are just completely unforgettable. And what I love about that score and a lot of the those scores, but it adds so much pathos to it. Like, you know, there's a lot of physical gags and slapstick and all of this, but it adds that score makes you feel so much for the tramp. And it just, it, it's where, yeah, it just adds so much um, emotion to that movie. And uh, I guess, I don't know if you said a scene, I guess the last scene when he realizes, um, or when, uh, yeah, when they when they when they reconnect at the at the very end um, with the the flower girl, um, it's just such a gorgeous Wait. gorgeous cue and um, just adds so much emotion to the whole film. Thank you, Carter. You got one. Uh, well, you know, I I would also have said the spaghetti western. Um, it's it's really when I was starting out. And I could only afford, like, say, four instruments. I just thought that Morricone just gave me a perfect example of how, if you choose the right four instruments, that you can, <laughs> you know, a score that be, is iconic, you know, and and also from the emptiness in those in those movies and the the music, it's um, uh, that's extraordinary. And then the only since Volker already took that one, um, I'm going to say <laughs> just say that a big influence. I mean, not in terms of anything about the the actual music but just conceptually was is the film forbidden planet um it's just such an extraordinary thing for a studio to let anyone make a score like that and um you know is the the um the people who are doing it the the barons they would make their own electronic circuits and the brilliant part is when they would first turn on a circuit, they would make sure the tape was running because sometimes the circuits would destroy themselves in like one second, but they would be sure there was always a tape running so that if it did just fry, they could then take that recording of that circuit frying and slow it down 16 times and make something out of it. Wow. And just the fact that that could have become a feature film and um, is, is still blows my mind. And I, I always love it. I always love watching it or hearing it um, just because it's so completely unique. Thank you, Carter. Rafiq, do you want to go? Have you got one? You're like, don't ask me. <laughs> oh man. I, I mean, I, it's so interesting what you're saying, Carter, about the like tape you know, like the instrument frying and self-destructing, it made me think of a semi-traumatizing recent experience where um, <laughs> I was uh, playing a set. Actually, Ian was playing with me. We were playing at Bryant Park in New York City for their like summer concert series. And it was this thing that I'd been looking forward to for a really long time. And um, I'm a guitarist. And about seven, seven minutes into this hour-long set, my like power supply for all of my electronics self-destructed and it was while I was looping a fragment of audio into a looper and I basically like had to perform the rest of the set using like instruments I was building on the fly on my computer I like <laughs> thankfully had a hard drive with me with these other things on it and but like I saved that little piece I saved that loop because I was like, this is one of the few ingredients I had. And at the end of the set, we like made a whole thing where like the DC pop of the power supply is short circuiting was like <laughs> the theme, you know, like it was like a looping <laughs> rhythmic fragment. But um, oh man, everybody's had such great ones. I feel like um, I would be remiss not to bring up my like very deep relationship to A.R. Rahman's scores, which I heard a lot in my house when I was a child. Like the score for Lagan in particular was one that was like pretty life-changing for my whole family. And, you know, because Bollywood movies, like the soundtracks themselves are like pop music, you know, like that would be like not only the new hit movie that came out, but also like 
the new hit record, <laughs> you know? And so in my house that would always be playing growing up. And I went through all of these different relationships to it in the same way that I did as like a teenager growing up in North Carolina, not quite being sure how I related to the world around me. And like, maybe, you know, like periods where I felt the same way about the music of Bollywood that I did about like the food that I brought to the lunch table that smelled weird and so the other kids would make fun of me you know like it was like this I had this sort of dissociation from that music as a teenager and going back to it recently has made me realize just how much like you know um the primacy of rhythm foregrounding like the color and interesting percussion um being able to like switch directions on a dime um into like you know another universe like shall we say like there are all of these things that there were these like subconscious precedents for in my mind and recently when I've gone back and listened to some of that stuff I'm just like oh like this has just all been here and everything I've made ever since then and I'm just playing it out you know like the thing that I was running in the other direction from at one point now feels like the closest thing to home, you know? Oh, amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Ian, why, who wants to go? Who wants to go last? I, I can go, not last. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I'll, I'll start by just saying that, like, um, some of the scores that had a big, made a big impression on me growing up were definitely scores from studio ghibli movies um so like uh uh spirited away and Spirit like away. uh house moving castle and castle like yeah that was like my disney growing up uh, in hong kong and um i think the composer for most <laughs> of those you know they're all very sort of like these sweeping very like kind of romantic like melodic scores but they were it definitely was something that like is like embedded deep inside of me um, there's like a sentimentality that's very specific to like those those scores um and then on a totally different tip i think more recently like um the i watched uh, annihilation and i really really liked the score for that that was ben salisbury minimal. and jeff yeah that's jeff barrow yeah, and ben yeah, salisbury, ben salisbury um, yeah and they did a really interesting thing where like for most of the movie, it was like almost this sort of like uh, kind of weird futuristic pastoral kind of thing that was like very understated um, in a lot of ways. But then they did this thing that really like made my eyes like jump out of my head at, right at the end where there's like this like intense encounter with, you know, this alien entity. And, and then suddenly there's this very like wild sounding like synth that comes in that you don't hear for like the whole movie previous to it and it was just like it was a very simple idea but it just like hit so hard and it was just a great kind of example of, of um, how contrast can be employed and how uh, restraint and like waiting to kind of like use something um, was kind of like something that really hit me something that we definitely didn't really do in everything everywhere all at once but uh, <laughs> it's like the opposite but that was that really that I really love that that uh that, that score yeah thanks Ian Ryan I'll just say that I think uh, a few of my most like lasting like most influential experiences with um film music uh or music used in film um maybe are came when one was decoupled from the other um like Morricone is 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 absolutely one of my favorite composers, but I first encountered his music apart from its original um, for for what it was originally designed. I think I I I, I definitely encountered him first uh, with Tarantino um, and Tarantino films. So, so definitely uh, coupled with film, but but not for its original intent. And then as I explored his catalog further, um, just uh, just um, like my brain is rewired, I think just the the economy of um, of instrumentation and the 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 sort of audacity to use certain things in combination with others and for space and for it to let the hall be the hall and to let the 
the spring reverb or whatever be the be the idea um those kinds of things just like yes 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 and then um you know with the shining hearing uh music that i had uh become haunted by as like a little you know european classical music geek um used in application taken out uh, away from its original context in, um for the concert hall and used um you know hear music for strings percussion and celeste um in a in a brand new way when when paired with visuals um i think there was a particular rewiring of my brain when that happened as well and then of course there will be blood you know some of those iconic scenes um you know accompanied by um you know music that was written in advance of you know not for that film but um i if, if anything it's it's a testament to how uh incredible um what an incredible sort of privilege we have um to witness um and to be part of to be part of an art form that exists in in many dimensions right and can can be seen from so many different angles and heard from so many different angles and is like waiting to be discovered from from different uh, perspectives and i'm just yeah that's just i love it oh listen thank you all so so much thanks Ryan, Ian, Rafiq, Carter, Volker, and Justin, really, really appreciate it. And Alexander as well for giving us his uh, his music to play tonight. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. Congratulations on your nominations. Uh, just to say to our audience, we've got some more, some more fantastic online sessions taking place this week, including supporting actress tomorrow night, directors on Wednesday, and leading actress panel on Thursday, all at 7 p.m. Make sure you register to attend at BAFTA.org and head to the What's On section. Uh, and of course, don't forget to tune in Sunday, the 19th of February, 7 p.m. BBC One for the BAFTA Film Awards. Thank you so, so, so much for tonight. It's been an absolute joy to chat to you all. Um, stay safe. Good night. Good afternoon. Good day. Whatever day, time of day is, wherever you are. Thank you for your time and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you on. Congratulations, Thanks. everyone. Thank yeah, you. you did. Yeah, congrats, guys. everyone. Looking forward to seeing you all soon. <laughs> yes, same. <laughs> <laughs>